I want to introduce the idea that there is a concept of the Bible called obedient faith. You notice there is a hyphen in this thing because I'm intending for it to be a hyphenated word, compound word, if you like. This obedient faith should be an English word, it should be a single compound word. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. The Bible concept of faith includes obedience, and the Bible concept of obedience includes faith. That's the truth of the matter. In English, we have separated them that as though faith is belief like believing in Santa Claus, but um, that's not faith. That's part of it, believe that God exists, I guess. That's part of it, sort of. But the other part, of course, is to believe that he rewards those who seek him, which is the obedient part. And both of these things in Hebrews 11.6 are laid out as what you believe, that is, what you have faith. Whoever would draw near to God must believe or have faith that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The faith that allows us to please him, the faith that allows us to draw near to him, requires that we both believe and look for a reward, for a repayment. To seek him is to obey him, to take actions in his name. We looked at some length in our earlier lesson today about Hebrews 11, at the lives and the choices of those who believed in God and believed that he rewarded them and made the choices that they did. That's There's a lot of effort involved there, that's, that's all. But this concept of obedient faith is to say, in the minds of the Holy Spirit as he pens these things, those are part and parcel. You don't have faith, if you will, that pleases God. You don't have the faith that draws near to him if you just believe that he exists, but you don't believe that he rewards people that seek him. And you don't have the faith that, that pleases God if you believe that good has its reward, but you don't believe in God. You have to have both things. And the way that it's formulated in Hebrews 11.6 is that that faith consists of the two. Which is why I would like for us to have a word that's more like obedient faith. If you turn over to James chapter 2, he said there fairly sharply in the 19th and 20th verses of James chapter 2, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He'll go on from there to explain this in some detail by using the example of Abraham. But this language is uh, fairly sharp. When he says you do well, you know, you believe that God is one, you do well. I think we would say, good for you. <laughs> it's actually the meaning. <laughs> you believe that there is a God. Good for you. <laughs> like, uh, this is like some great revelation. Like It's not enough to believe that, that God exists and that there is but one God, the one God of heaven and earth and all the things that are created by him. Uh, that's not enough. Even the demons believe and shudder. Those Servants of the devil in hell believe in God. They're terrified of God. That's not getting them out of hell. This is the point that James has. There's more to it than believing God exists. Believing that there is but one God in all the, all the universe. There's more to it. And 
And his larger point here is that faith without works is dead. He said, do you want to be shown that it's dead without works? And he goes on to the example of Abraham offering Isaac. But there is also here in James 2 a reference to Rahab. He says in the 24th verse, you see then, a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, wasn't Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? A person is justified by works and not by faith only. You believe there's one God good for you. The demons believe that too. But Rahab was justified by works as well. When was she justified by works? Because She was justified by works when she received the messengers, the spies, and sent them out by another way. That was the work that she did because she believed that God was giving them the land and that they would not overcome him. But remember what Hebrews 11 said about her? In verse 31, by faith, the, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So in Hebrews 11, 31, she received the spies with peace. In James 20. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 25, she received the messengers and sent them out another way. That is with peace, because if you remember the account, they were being chased by the king of Jericho and his forces. She protected them. But did you notice that in James 2, at verse 25, it said, wasn't Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she did this. But Hebrews 11.31 that said she did this by faith. So which one is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? It is both works and faith. The very same actions have this, what, you know, I guess a lot of people think is a contradiction. Well, one of them said she did that by faith, and this one said she did that as a work. One said by faith she didn't perish. The other one said by work she was justified. Which one is it? Well, it's both. That's the point. James isn't wrong. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. These are complementary it's clear that we are talking about the very same event, the very same actions, but in one case they're described as faith, in the other case they're described as works. Why is it? It's because of Hebrews 11.6 that faith consists of two things. Having faith that God exists and having faith that God repays workers. See, I'm objecting to the idea of Faith as a mental exercise. In English, faith is a mental exercise. See, it's like believing in something, believing that it exists. And that's not biblical. You believe there's one God, good for you. Like, that's not the biblical belief. Faith without the works is dead. They, they work together in James 2. Finally, we go over to Romans 16. Consider this one with me. Now, James was talking about faith and works in a general way to teach about this, but he also had specific reference to an example 
where a brother or a sister is destitute and in need of daily food? Should we tell them to rejoice? Or should we give them what they need? You know, what good is it if we don't give them what they need? That's a, an application of what he's saying. If you look with me in Romans 16, you'll see it does come down to a life that is the Christian life. So I don't mean to leave James in your mind as uh, an academic exercise, as, as a, you know, an, uh, an examination of the doctrines of men and of theology about faith and obedience. That's not the meaning in James. That's just the things that we talked about in this particular presentation. But I think Romans 16 is a little closer to the ground, and that's why we're using it. <coughs> Obedient faith, Romans 16. I like this idea of a compound word because look at what it tells you. Paul writes the churches in Rome, and there's lots of churches in Rome. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Cancrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Phoebe. A member of the church at Cancrea is doing work for the Lord and has helped Paul and other Christians over time. I understand there's sometimes people want that to be the office of deacon. That's unscriptural. It's just a general word, servant. That's unscriptural. We know that because of Acts chapter 6, that the apostles said, pick out from among you seven husbands full of the spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this matter. And it is the word for husband, the unambiguous word for husband. There are no female deacons. Nobody holds the office of deacon who is a woman. But the word deacon is just a generic word for servant. She is a servant. She is working, putting herself in a position of service for the saints. And that's fine. And when she's coming around, apparently, to different places, he says, receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. Assist her in whatever business she has need of you. You look at this woman, she is faithful. She's been working for that church, for Paul, for many. And she's coming around here and will need your cooperation and help too. At verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Priscilla and Aquila, we read about them in the book of the Acts, and he says they risked their lives. Their fellow workers in Christ Jesus, it's true, they were teaching you saw them helping Apollos in Acts 18, Acts 19 going into. You know that they helped Paul along and he was able to go and to preach among all the nations, starting on his way up the shore, going up to um, uh, the uh, Macedonia. And then uh, going back down into Greece, um, they sent him along, it says. And so those churches give thanks for Priscilla and Aquila. Fellow workers, risk their necks for my life. Is that a work? Yeah. Are they doing something? Yeah. Does it mean something? Yeah. It's important to them. It's, it's who they are. Yeah, my, my, you know, my, my, my secular work, if you will, or my occupation, that's not who I am. That's what I do. But when you're a Christian, this is your life. It is who you are. 
Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who are also in Christ before me. These have labored much, worked hard for you. I have fellow workers, fellow prisoners. They're doing things. They're active in the Lord. Their names are known. They know each other. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodion, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphenia, Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. You see the, the greetings going out to fellow workers, to beloved, to laborers. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother in mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Right, we have these who are workers. They're being called servants, fellow workers, putting themselves on the line, checking in to prison for the Lord. It is who they are. It's not just what they believe, it's what they do. It's how they live. It is obedient faith. That's who they are. These are the Christians. You know them because of their love. And you see the love because he sends the greetings. Send them hellos. Not just hello, but greeting is bid them Godspeed, if you will. It's the thing that's forbidden in 2 John 9 through 11 for a false teacher. You don't bid them a greeting. But these are true teachers. They're good laborers. They're Christians. They're marked because they're good. Now, the 17th verse mentions marketing, marking those who are not good. And that happens in the audience of all the churches. But the obedient faith is what we're focusing on here, and the 25th through the 27th verses will close. To him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. This God establishes us by that mystery, the revelation of the mystery through these apostles, it was secret but is now manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. The Bible is the power of God to salvation, the word of God. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, Romans 1.16. And what's being made known? Well the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. Obedient faith is all one thing in God's eyes. His message goes out to bring about obedience. And the final blessing, to God alone wise be glory through Christ Jesus forever. Amen. Now we're not in saying these things, we're not exalting ourselves or our actions. You know, Paul is not saying these Christians we read about in the first 12, 15 verses are somehow to be honored, you know, in the halls of history of the church. That's not what he's saying. They knew each other. Those, this, this letter was live. It was written to these people. They knew each other. He sent them hellos. We've mentioned... Christians in other places that we know, in our prayers, it's the same thing. The glory is to God. The wisdom belongs to God. It's not from us. And the glory comes to him through Jesus Christ. 
Those who are his children today, the Israel today, are those who obey him in Christ Jesus because they believe in him and they believe in what he wrote in the scriptures, what he caused the prophets to write, the message that has been sent into all nations. So we leave it there. I would like obedient faith to be a compound word. <laughs> it's really what the Bible means when it says faith. Never really means just this mental exercise of accepting the existence of something. It's always talking about if you believe God you're doing what God says. If you really believe that he exists, you really believe there's a judgment and you're going to be called into question, you're going to live accordingly. You're going to make choices that make sense with that. That's just part and parcel in, in the Greek language, actually. Very often when they say, uh, I believed him, they're literally saying, I was persuaded by him. Or when they say, you know, the soldiers, you know, the, the general gives a speech and the soldiers believing him marched forth. Well, they were saying the soldiers were persuaded by him and marched forth. <laughs> or they would say the soldiers obeyed and marched forth. Different translations. Because it's literally was persuaded by him. Well, if you were persuaded by him, i.e. you believe him, therefore you're doing what he said. That's part and parcel with the Greeks. They saw no... You can't say you believe him if you don't do what he says. But it's not because of the Greek language, see. It's because of the way that this is, is taught in Scripture. His word is the power to salvation. His word, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. Right? The power of God to salvation is the gospel, Romans 1, 16. Uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And now in Romans 16, the message of God through the prophetic words is his commandment for obedience to the faith. It's always this way. Jesus said, go forth, make disciples of the nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Do you believe in God? We can tell by whether or not you're doing what he says. Do you believe that there's a judgment that you'll be called into question? Are you working in the local church? You know, look at Romans 16. How much do we look like that one? Do we look like the first 15 verses or do we look more like the 17th verse? You know, which group do we fall into here? What are, what are we being marked for? What are we known for? What is our name? You read through the histories of the kings in the old testament there's always a summary for the king you know he walked in the ways of his father david right or he did evil before the lord they always summarized it what's going to be said about my life what am i doing what is you know the church is me and you we're the church in this place if things are being done they're being done by me and you and if they're not being done, they're not being done by me and you. And we have nobody to blame but ourselves there. <laughs> God will call us into question. Fairly easy, I guess, to point at other religions and their theological arguments. But, you know, just let's take our own inventory of what are we doing and what are we doing for God and are we living God's life and are we showing him through the power of him in our lives daily? Because obedient faith is what we have, is what we should have, is what the Bible enjoins upon us. So today, are you a Christian? Become a Christian, become a child of God. To get started on that right life, we have water here prepared that you may be baptized in the name of Christ, through whom all nations come to him. There's no other way but him. Have you done these things? Uh, therefore, you are a Christian but perhaps have not been living right since then, making the wrong choices. We'll get back on track. Pray God for forgiveness based on the repentance that is in your heart. But we're happy to pray with you for you that you might be restored to him. 
you need the prayers of the saints, you need to be baptized. Let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.